The next piece needs no introduction, but a little context might be useful. After all, as you will see, knowledge is power. A few definitions. Salvation. Referring to the Christian doctrine of sin or being saved from the wrath of God or hell. Grooming. Grooming is an insidious predatory tactic where the predator identifies and engages a victim and works to gain that victim's trust, break down defenses, and manipulate the victim to satisfy their own needs. Overt attention, verbal seduction, flattery, physical isolation, charm, gift giving, normalizing, secrecy, and threats are all hallmarks of grooming behavior. Gaslighting. The practice of brainwashing or convincing a mentally healthy individual that they are going insane or that their perception of reality is false. Please welcome to the stage, sharing a story from her memoir called Salvation, Why Bother? Kim Erickson. Simona, lay upon a bed a piece of foam atop a scrap wood frame. Ducking head first into the dirt floor shack, I spied a parade of ants marching up and down the table leg by her bed. Oh, any local could tell you Simona had been saved plenty of times, for she had attended every church in town, chasing each hallelujah with a shot of rum. While she'd been prayed over countless times by zealous missionaries and local church members, 12 questions and a prayer, she was saved. Amen. Yet she lay dying alone, except for the ants. How many of those who prayed over her ever lingered alongside her? Did they know the endless times a prostitute is raped? Did they know she never had a drink before her newborn babies died? First one and then the other. But she was saved with 12 questions and a prayer. This is salvation. Why bother? That day I had no premonition, no notion, the many ways my life would mirror Simona's. I too would drown my pain in a bottle. I too would question, where are the church people now? It was in fact the zealous missionaries and church leaders who would terrorize and escort me to the gates of hell. But salvation, and all I believed it to be, eluded me. Oh, I loved being a mother, a good and faithful Christian wife, animated. I began seminary, of course expecting to be treated like any other student, even any male student. Praising my insight and vision, Dr. Weidman hired me as a teaching assistant. So I boldly asked to join him on a rare visit to a protected Venezuelan tribe. Our small group would canoe, catch and grill piranha, interview locals, and fall to sleep in hammocks listening to the chatter of monkeys and other rainforest prattle. But walking beside the river, Dr. Weidman's words would dis distinguish me from his other students when he stated he was in love with me. I had no categories for this. Professors, especially married Christian ones, did not fall in love with their students. Over the next days, he would profess his love for me, then promise to treat me like any other student. He would approach me from behind with an embrace and then assure me this would end when we would return to the States. Oh, Dr. Whiteman embraced all his students. But when his hugs became intimate and he whispered, God is smiling down upon us. Who could I tell? Everyone esteemed this man. Oh, my marriage struggled, whose doesn't? 
but I never considered infidelity. I never anticipated Dr. Weidman descending the stairs of a monastery to enter my room, insert his penis, then apologize, saying he decided it was okay. Never had I foreseen what began as such genuine trust in a man would end in clandestine meetings. He promised he would never kiss me, but he did so often, just before lowering my head, along with his pants, followed by his pathetic apologies. Our family moved to Brazil where I first encountered Simona. I was finally out from under the shadow of the charismatic dean of mission and evangelism. Two years later, we returned to the States where I began the PhD program under a new mentor. Dr. Weidman asked to meet with me, so I scheduled a time when I knew his secretary would be close by. I told him, you need to respect my family and me. As the dean, I could not make him my enemy, but I believed I was free from his control. He would prove to be stubborn in his retreat. Yet what happened with Dr. Weidman would not prepare me for the professor of psychology, Dr. Stuart Palmer, first marriage, then personal counselor, classic wolf in sheep's clothing. Opening his door with a smile, he motioned for me to sit down, perhaps sensing I was now in the presence of an even more treacherous predator I always walked to the far end of the sofa from his chair, placing a pillow at my side as if that would protect me. Dr. Palmer gradually gained my trust and allegiance while slowly introducing doubt. Doubting my memories, my parents' love for me, even my friends, were I to flee, who would I turn to, paralyzed, as if struck by a venomous snake? Through the dimming of lights and repetitious suggestions, Dr. Palmer introduced my first dissociative of experience. I never asked for this, but it happened again and again and again. Dr. Palmer convinced me I was very mentally ill. As the lights lowered, his voice softened. I would awaken out of a trance-like state, his hand draped across my naked breast, or worse, remembering nothing. I spiraled into chaos as Dr. Whiteman still pursued me, and Dr. Palmer slowly pushed me to the edge except for some strand of sanity within me and a tiny warrior spirit who refused to let go of who I am. I am thankful for coherent moments in which God or the universe, however we speak of that source of life and love within us, open small window through which for an instant I might glimpse truth. I heard the term grooming and found a description of religious leaders who use charisma and power to gain sexual advantage over others. From somewhere I sensed a dynamic between Dr. Whiteman and another young woman. I saw myself. I saw this woman. It was as if the little warrior broke free and became brave. Dr. Wyman was escorted from the seminary on the day I was to teach my first class. I vomited all night, but could not speak about Dr. Palmer. It was still so strange and humiliating. I doubted myself in shame, yet somehow clung to that thread of sanity within me. Grooming, 
the term haunted me. I saw myself. I saw other women. I waited nervously in his office that day. When Dr. Palmer entered, I began reading the description of clergy grooming. I stared into his eyes. How are you different than Dr. Whiteman? He leaped at me, grabbed my arm to hurl me into the hallway, but the tiny warrior clung to the arm of the sofa and cried, no, you listen to me. As I continued reading the description and the names of other women, I suspected he was hurting. Dr. Palmer collapsed on the floor in tears, begging me to tell no one and to meet again with him in two days, promising to explain. Still bound to him in some bizarre allegiance, I agreed. I told no one. Once again, I sat waiting in his office. Surely two men were not predators. Surely he could explain. For three years he attested to my intelligence while slowly convincing me I was crazy. I felt crazy. The door flew open. He shouted, I'm headed with you. Get your things and get out. The door slammed behind him as he left. The abyss opened. I was being swallowed when I was caught by that single thread of sanity that would not snap and that tiny warrior spirit who refused to die. Suddenly I was standing both brave and afraid in one full sweep of emotion. I grabbed my things in self-preservation, ran from his office into the hall, turning a corner. I was face to face with his wife who shouted, you stop. She's here and she has your things. I had nothing of his. I raced past him, turned and cried, you're crazy. You're both crazy. I still feel the bitter cold of that next morning as I lay paralyzed staring out at the bluest of skies. Dr. Palmer accused me of stealing confidential files. The seminary fired me from teaching and removed me from the PhD program. I had nothing of his. I had nothing left of me. As I stared out that window, I wondered, who had I been before coming to this place? I had been a good and faithful Christian mother and wife. I only asked for respect. Instead, my body was violated, my mind tormented, and my spirit raped all in the name of God. That day with Simona, I had no premonition, no notion. I too would lose my children when threats and accusations drove me to another state. The police knocked on my door and took my son. Like Simona, I knew churches. I sang hallelujah. Like Simona, where were the church people now? Far from my children, I sought God and sanity, running long wooded trails. Like Simona, I could numb the pain one more day in a bottle. The tiny warrior longed to prove who I was, but even to see my children, meant returning to that place. Like a defeated soldier, 
returning to a former battlefield, I crumbled. Twenty years have passed since that trip to Venezuela. During my academic career at Asbury Theo Theological Seminary, I gained a Master of Divinity, Divinity with honors and a Master of Theology without mention. My name wiped from my program, my voice silenced. In return, I lost my children, my dreams, my dignity, and for a time, my sanity. Dr. Whiteman? Oh, he moved on to become vice president of a well-known evangelical mission agency. Dr. Palmer? An official document states he admitted having sexual intercourse with a woman in a therapy context. The seminary remained silent. I became his client only months later. Twenty years later, I hold no PhD, but I'm certain. Salvation has little to do with 12 questions and a prayer. Instead, it often entails a journey through a place in a woman's life she would never seek or ask anyone to go. But because of this journey, she values all persons. For as one suffers, my friends, we all suffer. Twenty years later, I have no dissertation to prove what salvation is. But I have the journey. And I have the voice to speak. What is salvation? Why bother? Salvation is when your children appear on your doorstep with a hug and say, love you, Mom, and don't disappear. Salvation is when the eyes that look upon you say, we believe you. Salvation is when you are present in this moment, knowing your connection to God, to Creator, to creation, all that came before, and all that lies ahead. Salvation is when you tell your dying mother, who always believed in you, I love you, Mom, and hear her whisper from the depths of her being, her last word, love. Love, yes, love in its purest form is the light through the darkest of journeys and is the source of salvation which lies within each of us. Sexual violation is always wrong. Predators will always exist. But the message of salvation from a Brazilian prostitute named Simona to me and all women voicing our experiences is that we can come through this terrible journey no longer afraid to speak for fear of shame or not being believed. We are women unafraid to insist upon change. Women who stand united in our uniquely painful experiences to say that this love cannot be stolen from us through negative words, unwanted touch, or even rape. It is this love, my friends, which compels us to bother and gives us the courage to speak. <laughs>